Welcome to Le Coin des Experts video podcast. Today, I'm very pleased to have Kate Power with me. Kate is a qualified Australian naturopath with a special interest in women's hormonal health. By integrating evidence-based medicine with natural healing practices, Kate addresses the underlying causes of hormonal disruption and, of to, and offers guidance, education and support through the healing process. Kate holds a Bachelor of Arts from the University of Sydney and an Advanced Diploma of Naturopathy from Nature Care College, Sydney. She is a member of the Australian Traditional Medicine Society and regularly furthers her education in naturopathic medicine with a particular interest in endometriosis, PCOS and perimenopause. In this interview, we'll talk about what endometriosis is, symptoms, causes and triggers, consequences on main body functions, endobelly and the gut, SIBO, pathology, treatment approaches, diet, and Kate's final thoughts to take home. As a reminder, everything that is discussed in this interview does not intend to diagnose or treat a medical condition, so please ask your healthcare practitioner before implementing any new treatment. Good morning, everybody, and welcome, a warm welcome today to Kate Powell. So Kate is a naturopath, an Australian naturopath, and an expert in endometriosis. So today's going to be all about endometriosis. So welcome, Kate. Welcome to be here with us, with a French audience as well. So bonjour, bonsoir, and of course, <laughs> thank you very much, Rosaria, for having me. I'm very, uh, yeah, it's lovely to be able to talk to you and your audience. So thank you. Uh, thank you. We are very, very um, happy to have you here. So let's start with the, from the beginning. So what is endometriosis? Yeah, it's a big question. It's um, no one knows exactly, you know, what it is really, but it, it is an inflammatory type chronic disease that uh, women can experience. And really it's where the endometrial or it's um, endometrial like tissue, which is found inside the uterus and what sheds every month when you have a period is found external to the uterus. So some of that um, similar tissue is found can be attached to things like your ovaries or your large intestine or that kind of thing and because it's an inflammatory type um, substance it can cause inflammation pain scar tissue adhesion so it, it you know really does impact a woman's sort of pain levels and uh, mental health throughout her her cycle absolutely absolutely and um so the symptoms um can be of course, painful uh, and yeah. uh, um, all sorts of inflammation, inflammatory symptoms. And um, do we know um, today, do we know more about the causes behind endometriosis? What are the causes and possibly the triggers? Yeah, lots of um, theories behind it, but there's still no one definitive answer and there's still no, is no cure per se. So what we're dealing with, you know, initially the the thoughts were behind retrograde menstruation so where some of that uh, menstrual blood flows back out through the fallopian tubes um, which does happen in a lot of women but then the the um, I guess the theory behind that is well a lot of women experience that but not every woman gets endometriosis so what's happening to that woman that right. it, it could be causing it um, the latest kind of theory that's a little bit more accepted um, is something called the bacterial um, uh, hypothesis so it's where they now recognize in that peritoneal fluid that is in the, um, you know, surrounds all the organs around your pelvic cavity, there is a substance called li lipopolysaccharide, which is um, from the cell walls of gram negative bacteria. So things and like PS, PS, right? P or right. I and all those things. And that really, you know, kind of comes into play with SIBO. And, you know, we will talk about that a little bit later as well. But Really, it's the chicken and egg theory of is is the inflammation coming from the gut across into the pelvis, or is the inflammation from the endometriosis also then driving, you know, gut bacteria backwards sort of thing? So, it, it I, I think the the answer really is there's a combination of lots of different potentials. There's also a very strong genetic setup. So we also sort of talk about endometriosis a little bit like like an autoimmune disease even though no one's saying it is an autoimmune disease just yet but 
it, yeah. it shares a lot of similar um, traits to uh, a, a disrupted immune system. So part of this bacterial contamination hypothesis really is that the macrophages, which should be going into your pelvic cavity to clear up uh, all this endometrial tissue that's sort of uh, hanging about in there, uh, it, it doesn't recognise and it's not doing it. So it's why is that immune system not regulating and not getting the signals to clear up uh, those lesions in some women and not in others. So there is a bit of a genetic a genetic component, I think, to that as well. Yeah. Wow, that's so um, fascinating and still, of course, uh, waiting for more answers, right? So it's um, it's an ongoing ongoing field of research. And it totally is. Yeah, and and I think you know just getting back to the symptoms a bit as well. It's 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 hard to tell because as we said, pain's a really obvious symptom behind endo, but not in everyone. You know, some women don't have much pain, and potentially they might be experiencing more things like you know spotting or infertility might be their biggest issue. It's a big one, isn't it? Yeah, it's huge. So it can be it can also be really difficult to find the women that have endo in the first place. It's more obvious if there's significant pain, you sort of that's a trigger. But if everything else looks kind of normal and they've only got potentially infertility that hasn't been linked, um, then it's harder to sort of, you know, that diagnosis of endo becomes longer and then um yeah, it's hard to sort of find out well what's been happening in their background and what other things have been going on, like the gut stuff and yeah, everything else. So yeah, it's um, uh, it it is hard, and I know it's um, it's something which can be like a chronic, uh, condition, a chronic sight, of course, for many women. Um, and I was just thinking that some, you know, I remember, you know, uh, even friends at school, you know, uh, being suffering like crazy and, uh, being almost accepted, like oh, you know, it's normal, you have to suffer, it's normal to be in pain, you know, uh, once a month. Um, whereas it shouldn't be right. Yeah. Oh, and it's and it's. Uh, I think the generations going forward now are, are slightly more fortunate in that there's a lot more information out there. And you know, I think when uh, back in my generation and previous generations, it's no one talked about their periods or their cycles. And now at least it's quite acceptable, mm -hmm. and people are taking that that ownership back of their own um, bodies, which is great. Um, but yeah, no one talked about it. So how do you know what pain is? normal because only you'll felt it so you just think that's what everybody feels so oh, yeah, yeah very very difficult um yeah for people to talk about as well as get diagnosed i guess yeah and so you were mentioning um possibly the connection the bacterial connections or lps um mm -hmm. and uh digestive issues of course and Never. digestive symptoms so it is interesting because uh as you know of course i i see a lot of SIBO patients uh, and that's something that is in my mind, so asking about more um, possible presence of endometriosis and pain and menstrual pain and uh, menstrual issues. Um, can you tell us more about the digestion and how uh, the two may be uh, present? What, what is yeah. And it's a really important for me diagnostic as well because, we're, we, as you said, lots of people have gut issues and SIBO is now becoming more and more prevalent and more and more accepted and being able to be tested and that sort of thing. With endo women, I think the stat is now it's either 90 or 95% of women uh, with endometriosis have SIBO or some form of gut condition. And as any endometriosis woman will tell you about what's called endo belly, it's like where the, you know, you'll wake up with a flat stomach and by the end of the day you look six months pregnant, yes, you know. Yes, yes, it, yes. It's just crazy. And they can't put it down to a particular food or, you know, that sort of thing. So that has for a long time been um, very prevalent in endo women, this endo belly and what's causing it. And as I sort of alluded to earlier, it's kind of like, well, is it a, a part of it can be actually the inflammation caused by the endometriosis causing disruption in the gut. But but also there's definitely a, I think, all, also what's laid down at birth, you know, part of it is the genetic component to it, your microbiome that you've got from your mother and your grandmother who probably also had endometriosis may not be that stable either and you may not have the best strains in there and you know there's there's lots of that side of things going on as well so and that's little... very, yeah that's very interesting so getting back to the endo belly so the endo belly um in your patients would it would it be present all month long 
uh, or is it more um, prevalent during certain times of the month? How does it present for you? Yeah, no, I'd definitely say it's all month long. There's what does change is and what's very common, not just with endo women, also women with high estrogen, for example, which many endo women will have, um, is a change of bowel or a change of stool right before the period. So often people will suffer diarrhea, for example, um, right before the period, and that's due to serotonin changes and hormonal changes and that sort of thing. So that is changeable. But pretty much if you're an endo woman, you've got that bacteria that's just, just the- there time and it's driving the the LPS drives the endo and which you know drives everything else so until you're dealing with it like um you know a, a gut issue which is also where your immune system obviously is how so we're looking at immunity from that point as well uh that will just keep occurring so things like treating SIBO is super important yeah for endo yeah that's very interesting because normally in SIBO patients uh the protein comes uh soon after having eaten certain foods, right? Yeah. But what I've seen in some of my patients, especially my female patients, is that sometimes the bloating is there all the time. Yeah. So they wake up with the bloating, they have the bloating, which gets be- which gets worse after eating, but the bloating is still is there even in the morning. And so yeah. this could be maybe a, a wake up, um, you know, a question, uh, about endometriosis and i think that's really wise too i think that's so true knowing the stat of at least 90 95 percent of women have SIBO who have endometriosis any of your patients that have SIBO always be on there a look out of what else is going on around period is is that part of the issue you know absolutely yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. so there's a big big connection thank you for mentioning that this is a really very very important very important to know and very important though for us as practitioners and, and yeah. to patients as well um, because endometriosis, as we know, is very hard to diagnose, right? Yeah, really tricky to diagnose because really the the gold standard is a laparoscopy, which is a keyhole surgery, and no one wants to hold <laughs> go for surgery to get of a diagnosis yes. for their own sake. But also, surgery comes with risks as well, right? Like it can cause you know scarring and and other sort of problems with doing that. So. It really is a diagnostic of um, symptoms first and foremost, you know, and, and and really if if your pain is significant enough to either stop you missing school or work or outings or you're, you know, nauseous or you're vomiting or, you know, it's that severe or you're taken to hospital, which quite a lot of my clients are, have done as well with unexplained pain, Um then it's definitely not just PMS. You know, it is something to really go right. There's something wrong here. So that's a huge diagnostic. Um, but how about um, maybe blood tests um, for those that are, are, do not have that um, open clinical symptoms? Maybe, as you said, some people may not have the the, the classic, you know, presentation of endo. So um, what else? What else can we do? Can we do some blood tests or anything else? Yeah, there's again, there's no there's no definitive blood test to say you have endometriosis. So really, the the way that I look at it, and I, I'm actually not sure how it is in in France, but um, one of the best tools we can use is something is a like a pelvic ultrasound, a transvaginal ultrasound, but it's specifically for endometriosis. So it's called a, a DIE ultrasound. Doesn't it's not a very nice acronym, <laughs> but um, a um, yeah, it's it's basically um, a deep infiltrating endometriosis ultrasound. So it's really done by a a specialized sonographer to to look for endometriosis specifically. So that's a, a you know it's still about 80 percent accurate. It's not one hundred percent accurate either, but it's better than having to go for surgery. And then if we're talking bloods, um, again, there's no definitive blood test, but I often look for some markers which can give us a little bit of info. And one of those is called a CA one two five. And it's actually the ovarian cancer marker, yeah, yeah. which you're testing for. But really what we're looking for is if it's, you know, above certain ranges, it does indicate that there's pelvic inflammation going on. And that could be caused by anything from polyps to fibroids to endo to, you know, it doesn't mean cancer. It just can mean there's a, an amount of reproductive inflammation. So that's a good one when I'm not quite sure, you know, if someone may or may not, I'll often look to that one and if there's, you know, a CA125 over 8 or over 15, 
then I'll go, there's something amiss around there and, yeah, follow it up further. Yeah. Okay. And and also just on the other testing, because as we're talking about um, uh, the immune system, uh, it can often be a trigger too for endo. So it can be from pathogenic, you know, um, triggers that, that can potent or, you know, think might drive the endometriosis further. So it's also just good to get a case history and or pathology on things like Epstein-Barr virus, cytomegalovirus, you know, which causes chronic fatigue. A lot of people have around their 20s, 30s, um, Lyme disease, moulds, all those kind of things. Because if there's a history, even a history without testing of, you know, being on a farm with pesticides or being in a mould-ridden house or having Lyme disease or, you know, that sort of thing, that can be a big sort of red flag as well to to potential endometriosis being treated. Yeah. And how about digestive um, um, triggers and maybe digestive tests? Do you test for SIBO or, you know, stool tests or other types of uh, tests? Yeah, there are a couple of other functional tests around. So things like um, a complete digestive stool analysis is always, I think that's really good because it can give us a good um, look into what's happening within that digestive process. And if there's any parasites or, you know, often certain parasites can be sort of triggers as well. So that's great. Um SIBO, if yeah, um, I will do SIBO tests in some people. It just depends on how much other testing and what you know. You can go down a rabbit hole with with this. So or, it, yeah, it's about balancing which we're going for. But definitely SIBO is another thing. And then we can also look at things like um, we can now do vaginal uh, microbiome tests as well. So not just looking at the gut, but looking at the um, colonies of of um, uh, microbes within the vaginal cavity as well, and and just seeing what that sort of lay of the land and setup is as well. So Wow, okay. That's still really useful. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And have you seen the um, improvements in uh, your patients once treating, for instance, like um um digestive issues, do do symptoms see uh, endometriosis symptoms get better or it, it, look they do definitely without doubt, but it but it also depends on the severity of the condition oh, that that has and so a woman set up exactly so some people are able to clear things easier than others but absolutely and I think it, even as we're talking about um gut the, the the role of diet is also you know we can talk about uh, so many different options of diet as well and again there's no one endo diet I found it really does depend on are we focusing on things like high histamine and a histamine SIBO type situation are we looking at things like um, there's some recent research around nickel allergy associated with endometriosis? So looking at how high um, nickel foods are in the diet, and they're not, you know, particularly intuitive foods. So you, you do need to kind of have a list of what are high nickel foods, and and they can be quite triggering for endo women. So it might be a, a low nickel diet that we we're looking at, or it can be something as simple as a Mediterranean style diet, where really we're just trying to get lots of um, olive oil and and good you know a less meat heavy diet and a more plant based diet in there, and that's where I see a lot of um, yeah good effects with people starting with diet taking out things that are really inflammatory like yeah, dairy um, and gluten. Yeah, of okay. course, of course, yeah. and I understand of course uh, treatment approaches can be multiple and um, it has to be tailored of course to everybody, so we can't really generalize. Um, what um, but generally, uh, endometriosis can be um, helped, even if it's not like uh, uh, solved hundred percent. I yes. guess it's something that uh, people get better. So yeah, what would be your, uh, you know, what would you like to share for people that suffer possibly from endometriosis? What would be your... yeah? Look, there's there's some great natural treatments. As I said, if you start with diet and just cleaning up that diet, that can be a really positive um, shift. Then with things like supplements, they can also be using food as supplements. So the biggest, probably my number one recommendation is always curcumin or turmeric. So it's one of the best anti-inflammatories. It has some really good efficacy about stopping endometrial lesion growth and inflammation. Um, and it's also just a really nice liver kind of detox. So when you're trying to detox estrogen um, out of your system as well. So um, curcumin, and you can get that through your food. You can cook it. You can have your turmeric latte. You know, get as much as you can through food. Get as much as you can. <laughs> as much as you can. Often we need higher therapeutic doses, obviously, through oh. supplements. But if, if it was one sort of thing, I'd say curcumin. And then just basic things. Yes, there's lots of intricacies we can get into. But 
just getting good zinc and good magnesium, um, you know, are really important. And then possibly would be looking at antimicrobial treatment again, because we're looking at this bacterial um, hypothesis. And there's actually been a bit of research too on um, use of antibiotics, which sounds very counterintuitive, but it it works. And and often the more anti-inflammatory antibiotics um, having some really good efficacy in in endo. So. Um, yeah, again, I'm not ideal for a healthy person, but if someone is suffering with a chronic disease, we have to look at, okay, well, what, what works for those people? So um, definitely. How about probiotics? Do you use probiotics at all? or I do, but I am often um, use them a bit later in, in the treatment. Stage, yeah. In the treatment. And also it depends on, I often look for low histamine strains as well. So it, quite, it gets down to being quite strain specific for probiotics, yeah. And it is interesting what you were saying that basically it's all about decreasing inflammation, right? Decreasing the inflammatory load and inflammation as much as we can, which is very similar to many other conditions that we see nowadays. It's all about inflammation, inflammation, inflammation. And and I think it feels like that's part of this as a society where, you know, generations, we're getting more and more inflamed. Like, you know, it's, it's, I think the level of toxicity in our environment and is playing a huge role in that as well as the genetic and epigenetic changes that we all are going through. And I think you're exactly right. It doesn't really matter what the condition is. It's treating the body as a whole and trying to keep it as um, uninflamed and as natural and um, clean as possible and, and letting keeping all your systems working. Um yeah, it's something really important that I, I think we are becoming, you know, it, it's re- it's really difficult. I don't think generations ago, it's not just about diagnostic techniques being better now. I think we are, um, you know, living in a in a tougher environment and, and our bodies are under a lot more pressure. So it's just yeah, important. Yeah, absolutely. Happy yeah. And um, yeah, so any final thoughts for, for us, for uh, your audience here or in general? Yeah, just um, A, don't put up with pain. If it feels like it's more than you can handle, then investigate it and don't be afraid to get a second and a third opinion because there's, you know, lots of good and not so good people out there in treating it. Um, But also don't, um, the one thing I would do want to say is endo also has a big um, component of stress and trauma attached to it. So there's there's a definite emotional part of it. So don't the, a lot of my endo women are more type A personalities and want to do absolutely everything perfectly. And I'd say that's part of your first port of call is don't think there's one right way of doing absolutely anything. Be gentle on yourself. Go slowly with this because this is a lifestyle change. It's not just a quick fix in three months and you'll be right. Um, so go easy on yourself and be gentle and just and enjoy exploring different options of how to treat your body and how to make it feel better. Yeah. Oh, that's one of very, very wise advice. And of course, stress is a big component. Stress, trauma can be big, big issues there. Uh, but that was wonderful. Okay. And do you, do you see international patients? Do you work internationally, I guess? Yes, I do, Rosario. Thank you. I, um, my website is katepower.com. And yes, I see lots of people, um, on Zoom, uh, from all over the world. So yeah, that's wonderful. Do you speak French? Uh, no, <laughs> unfortunately not, but maybe I can start learning. Yeah, no, 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 but yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of uh, English speaking people around here, of course, in York. So yeah, it would be great. It would be great. So, uh, well, it was awesome. Okay. It was really, really, um, uh, wonderful information and, um, especially your, you know, um, final thoughts. So don't put up with pain, uh, don't stop at the first or second uh, opinion out there. So there are, there are some specialists, but there are some people that are not really specialists. So it is hard. I'm not sure how about uh, specialists here in France, but I'm sure there must be some good specialists as well. Yeah. 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 And, um, yeah. and it was amazing. Thank you so much, Kate, for being with us today. And maybe Thank we'll catch up again uh, soon. So anyway, yes. it was such a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, Rosaria. Thank you.